Last week, Pastor Rod covered Romans chapter 5, did an awesome job, and rolling through Romans, it is a, just such a life-giving book, you know? Um, those first three chapters are a little, a little difficult for just about anybody, but, um, but as we get into 4, 5, and 6, and we're rolling through this, some of my favorite scriptures are, are literally right here because it's so life-giving. It's absolutely packed full of, of God's purpose and his plan and what he actually did for us. It is the gospel. And so um, I'm going to go back and I'm going to just read chap, uh, chapter 5, verse 20 and 21. It's just wrapping up chapter 5 in Romans. Now, I will be teaching out of the New Living Translation. Um, I was teaching out of the ESV, and um, Brittany told me, she's like, that's just not going to cut it. You know, like it's too difficult to be able to process through that. So she got me this new Bible, and man, am I very glad that she did. Like I had a bunch of things that I wanted in my Bible, you know, multiple different things that, that, I felt would help me be able to study and process it and stuff. I like to write in the margins and everything like that. And um, then I put this leather cover on it, and I had my, my daughters, like, burn in stuff on, on each one. Kyrie did this, and it, um, it's the symbol of the Nazarene. I don't know if you all are familiar with that, but, like, over in a lot of uh, Muslim countries and stuff, whenever they're running the Christians out of their homes or or raping them and killing them and all that stuff, they, they write that symbol on the side of the house to let everybody know that a Christian lived there. And that's why this bad stuff happened to them. And I'm like, okay. Well, it, it kind of backfired because now it's like, it's the symbol of Christianity, like a movement. It's like, it's something that people are grabbing onto and being like, Okay, so be it, you know. Um, so I had her put it on the back of there. So if anybody tries coming after me, then, well, we'll see how it plays out. <laughs> Thanks. Jesse's going. Anybody else going with me? Yes. All right. Yeah, I figured we'd have some takers in here. Um, before we get started, let's, let's just pray real quick. Not that your prayer wasn't good enough, Rod, but. Heavenly Father, God, I just pray that you will just open up our minds to be able to receive from you today, Lord. I pray that your Holy Spirit will just speak to our hearts, Lord. Speak to our minds, God. Make this word real to us, God. Make it come alive to us, Lord, and help us to be able to apply these things to our lives, God, and help us to um, grab a hold of your truths to be able to live out our lives for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so you can turn with me to Romans chapter 6, well, the end of 5 if you'd like. I don't know about you guys, but whenever I try to follow along and I'm using a different translation than the teacher, um, my mind is, is going back and forth from listening to what they're saying and trying to follow along and it doesn't match up, you know, and I'm like, what's going on here? So... If you do use a different translation than the New Living, you might just want to listen for now and go back. But if your mind doesn't like mine, you can feel free to try to follow along. So, verse 20 in chapter 5 says, God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. So just as sin ruled, past tense, ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules, present tense, rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's how he, I mean, that's how chapter 5 wrapped up. That's stinking awesome. That's absolutely awesome. So, um, 
I didn't really title it, but if I was going to title this teaching, it would be, He Makes All Things New. He makes all things new. Isn't it interesting that He made all things in the first place? And then whenever sin entered the world through Adam, Rod talked about that last week, it, it corrupted us. It corrupted mankind. It corrupted God's perfect plan for our lives. He's given us a free will. He's given us the option, you know, we can do whatever we want. But His perfect will is perfect. His plan for us is so much better than our free will. So much better. Because He knows us inside and out. We think we know us. Anybody think they know themselves pretty well? Right? We think that we know us. But I want you to think about something else. Not just the fact that, that you feel like you know you. You do know you better than anybody. You know your thoughts. You know you better than any human on this earth. But God knows the number of hairs on your head. Or eyebrows or whatever, if you're like me and my father-in-law, Danny. Bald. But He knows us inside and out. He not only knows who He made us to be, how He created us, all of our giftings, all of our, our downfalls. He knows all of it inside and out. And He knows the absolute potential that we have in Him if we walk in Him, if we walk through Him, if we accept what He has for us. So Paul, he goes on and he says, you know, it, it talks about, right there at the end, it talks about, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then he goes on, well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Absolutely not. Absolutely not, he says. But that's, that's what people were, were starting to believe. They were starting to misinterpret what Paul was teaching, what he was saying saying that God's grace, what He's done, He's poured out His life for us. He's given His life for us. So we should be able to walk in this grace, and, and they're thinking we should just be able to do whatever we want then, and we'll be fine. You know, where sin abounds, grace abounds more. So, hey, why not sin? No, that's a complete misconception of the absolute truth because God wants us to be holy just as He is holy. And He... Tells, he lets us know, you can't do it on your own. That was the whole purpose of the law. He said, I gave you the law to show you that you can't do it on your own. It's impossible to do it on your own, but I gave that to you to show you that so that you would run to me, so you would rely on me, so that you would put your faith, hope, and trust in me, knowing that I could accomplish those things through you. You can't not sin on your own, but... You can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. If you keep your eyes fixed on me, I'm going to help you do it all. So, he goes on and says, of course not. We shouldn't continue on more and more. He says, since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. Let me hit on that for just a second. You know, we think that, that um, whenever we come to church and we, we get saved, we hear about God and stuff, and it's like, okay, this is great. I'm going to try this out for a little bit. I'm just going to give it a shot. I'm going to put my toes in, but I'm not going to jump all the way in because I want to see what it's like, you know? That's not the... That's not what we're supposed to do. That's not the purpose. That's not the point. We get baptized. So whenever we come into this, this knowledge and this understanding, this relationship with Christ, he, he tells us to get baptized. And He wants us to get baptized for this very reason. The, the whole purpose of being baptized is death, burial, and resurrection. It's showing. It's, it's not like whenever you come up, you're physically changed. I've seen some people um, 
changed significantly. I mean, the second they boop, pop up out of the water, I mean, just totally changed. It, I mean, healed even from things. That doesn't always happen. So we, we shouldn't expect it to always happen. But when we enter into this relationship with Jesus, whenever we say, you know what? I'm going to make you my Lord and Savior. I'm going to live for you. It's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives through me. If you, if you truly want this relationship with God, it's going to cost you something. But he wants us to get baptized because this baptism shows us that, and, and it's not just us. It's, it's us being baptized into Christ, into this relationship with him. And so we're dying to the flesh. We're dying to the old, the old man, the sinful nature. We're dying to all of that. We're, we're accepting that we are crucified with Christ. That means that our lives are gone. Our lives are gone. What we used to want, what we used to strive after and strive for, all of that stuff. He's not saying that you're going to physically die. But he's saying that it's this representation that your old person is dead. You're being buried, going under that water. You're being buried, and then Christ is rising you raising you. You are, being, you are being raised again as a new creation in Christ Jesus. A new creation in Christ Jesus. That's outstanding. That is so amazing. But people think, you know, they, they, they hear stuff like this, that, that we've died, that we have to die. And they're like, what in the world? I, I don't want to die, you know? It's, it's so much better. It's so much better. This death that it's talking about is death to sin, is death to decay, to destruction. This relationship that we enter into with Christ, it doesn't end. We get to live with Him for all eternity. So when this breath leaves this body, we get to enter into an everlasting relationship with Him, literally, from glory to to glory. That's so amazing. And that's what, what Paul is trying to get across here. He says, And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may, he uses the term may, we may live. This is a decision that we have to make. You can walk out all of these, go through the motions, but if you haven't made the decision then what do the motions mean? I've told you before, you can know this Bible inside and out. You can know every single word of it. But if you don't apply it to your life, it means nothing. It's not going to change you. It's not going to change who you are. It's not going to change your outcome in eternity. It helps to truly know the one, you know. But it's the decision. It's the decision that we make that changes us. So he says this this power and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, so the power of the Father gave him, raised him from the dead, says, now we also may live new lives. It says we can live new lives. We don't have to continue down the same path of destruction, of despair, of hurt and turmoil. We don't have to because our hope is in Christ Jesus. And he gives us this same hope. He says, since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. You know, I was doing protection for uh, somebody last weekend. And another guy on one of the protection details, he was talking about how he is a, um, he's a Jew and he's... Um, even has, like, he showed me this card. It had the Star of David and stuff on it. You could tell he wasn't committed, though. You know, he wasn't committed, but he was, he was kind of proud of it. And we started talking, and super awesome, dude. So fun to be hanging out with. But um, I told him, I said, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good friends with a Jew as well. And he goes, really? And I said, yeah. I said, you might know him. Uh, his name's Jesus. Uh, he was from Nazareth. And he goes, Oh, okay. He goes, yeah, you can believe in your false prophet if you want. And I started laughing. I said, apparently you don't know history very well. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, he, 
he was he was convinced that Jesus wasn't raised from the dead. You know? I that just doesn't make it doesn't make sense to me. There's so much historical proof that proves that he was raised from the dead. I'm talking people that didn't didn't care about Jesus, didn't have any kind of relationship with him whatsoever, good, bad, or indifferent, documented the fact that he was raised from the dead and that hundreds of people saw him and walked with him afterwards. And they documented the people that were dead before him rose to life too and were walking around Jerusalem. That's, that's wild. That is so awesome. I just I won't go too far down that, that route, but... It does say that we will be raised to life with him. That means when this physical body is dead and decaying in the grave, we're already going to be raised with him. So why would we fear death? Why would we fear sickness and disease? Why would we fear putting this body away and, and living in a resurrected body with him? I mean, that's, that's going to be awesome. That's going to be awesome. Can't wait. It says, we know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. That's why we do this. So has anybody struggled with a sin that you just can't stand about yourself? That you just, you just wish like crazy you could not do this? That you, that you wouldn't give in to this? I know I have tons of it. Tons of it, you know. And this tells us that our old sinful selves, that, that body, that person, who we were, we were crucified with Christ. And we don't have to continue that. We don't have to continue um, to walk in that. You know, whenever it talks about grace, Paul's talking about grace here. And so I pulled it up and I wanted to just make sure that I understood the full definition of grace. First of all, he says that his grace is sufficient for us, that, um, that we don't have to continue in this life because he gives us grace. And this grace says a free and unmerited favor of God. It's the free and unmerited favor of God. Unmerited means that you, you literally don't deserve it, but it's given to you anyway. That sinful nature that we were walking in, that sinful nature that we were living in, it says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to stop being sinners till he died for us and paid the ultimate price for us. It was while we were still sinners. It's unmerited favor of God as manifested in the salvation of sinners and the bestowal of blessings. So he bestows blessings on us it's this unmerited favor. It's manifested, though, in salvation. It's manifested in salvation. That means it comes about when we ask God to, to forgive us, to forgive us of our sins, and that we believe that He is who He says that He is. That's when this grace is manifested in us and through us. Oh, man, I just... I really could stay on that forever, but I'm not going to. We are no longer slaves to sin. No longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. So this doesn't say that sin never had power over us. It says that whenever we were crucified with Christ, whenever we gave up our own lives, that's whenever that sin lost its power. It lost its power. It had power, but now it no longer has power over us. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with Him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead, and He will never die again. Death no longer has any power over Him. When He died, He died once to break the power of sin. How do, how do you like the phrase, He will never die again? Have you ever felt like 
that even after you come into this relationship with him, even after you give your heart to him, and, and you, you sin again, you do that thing that you wish that you would never do again, the enemy starts whispering in your ear, oh, I can't believe you just did that. That, uh, go figure. Go figure. Of course you would do that, wouldn't you? You just put Jesus back on the cross. You just made Jesus suffer more. What you just did made Jesus suffer more. That's what the enemy whispers in your ear. I know he whispers it to you because he whispers it to me. And he uses the same tactics on all of us. He doesn't pull out anything new. It's the same old junk. Right? But it says that Jesus died once. He's not going to do it again because when he did it, it was enough the first time. That death. That sacrifice, that blood that he shed when he was tortured and tormented and his flesh was ripped off of his body when he was hanging on that cross. That was enough for all the sins that you will ever commit. From the very first one to the very last one, the very last breath that you take, it covers all of it. But it doesn't just cover you, it covers mine. It covers everybody in this room and everybody till the end of the ages. So whenever Satan starts to whisper that crap in your ear again and makes you feel like that, oh, well, you just, you just crucified Jesus again. No, that's a lie from the pit of hell. And you need to rebuke it. And you need to say that I am the righteousness of Christ. I was bought with a price, the most precious price, the love and life of Jesus Christ. And it was done. It is done. It is finished. That's why he says whenever he's on the cross, it says that he was hanging on the cross and he cries out in a loud voice, it is finished. It is finished. What that it is finished means is not my suffering is finished. I'm no longer going to have to be in pain on this cross. It means that the price that he had to pay for your life is finished. He paid it. And now no one can take it. All you have to do is believe and accept and walk in that. Like he gives us this free gift. It says, but now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. Jesus, now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. You know, in John 17, it says that we glorify Jesus. We do. And I know you're probably thinking, I don't know if I do. Yes, you do. You absolutely do. You absolutely bring him glory. He loves you so very much, more than you could possibly wrap your mind around. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. This is, he's telling us, consider yourself dead to that old sinful nature. And consider yourself alive to the God who bought you with a price. He tells us that's what we should do. Now it goes on and he says, Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give into sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. And I, I know, first time I read this, I'm like, how? How? Because I constantly feel like I'm battling this, you know? I constantly feel like it, that it's the struggle. I've got a tattoo of a lion and a dragon on my chest to represent that, that constant battle where Satan's trying to pull me back and, and Jesus is overcoming that. But Jesus has to overcome that. The reason that there's a lion on there is because he's the lion of Judah. And he gives me the power to overcome. He overcomes. I can only overcome through the power that he gives me. I know for a fact I can't do it on my own. I spent lots of years failing on my own. I have to do it through him. And we can do it through him. We can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. But it also leads me to one of mine and, and my father-in-law's favorite verses is 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says, The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. 
When you are tempted, He will show you a way out so that you can endure. Is that not awesome? It says the temptations that we're struggling with. They're common to man. They're the same temptations that people have been struggling with for all of eternity. It's not like we're dealing with new temptations. Satan's still trying to tempt us to fall, to sin, to get our focus off of God, off of Christ, off of the Holy Spirit, to get us off of Him and onto whatever this is. You know that sin is not the real problem? Sin is not the real problem. You're thinking, what are you talking about, Nathan? The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin are death. But why? Why are the wages of sin death? It's because we stop looking at God and we keep focused on this sinful junk. That's it. Because it, it pulls us away from Him. We start focusing on this junk that doesn't, that doesn't matter. It doesn't lead to life. It leads to death. If He's the only way, the truth and the life... He's the only way that we can get to the Father is through Jesus. And we're all focused on this, this sin even if, even if you already believe in God. But you're focused and, and you're so focused on, I wish I wouldn't do this. And you're so focused on trying to not do it. You're focusing on trying not to sin is what's separating you from God. That's it. That's what separates you from Him because you're not looking at Him anymore. You're so worried about stop, stopping doing what it is that you feel like is so horrible. And it is horrible, but he's the only one that can remove it from your life. I'm living proof of that. So don't let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become as an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead... Give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master. For you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Why would he tell us why would he tell us this? Why would he tell us that we no longer live under the requirements of the law? It's simply because the law only came to show us that we needed him. That's it. That's it. Now we know that we need him and we know that his grace is the only thing that is sufficient for us. I love how he said, sin is no longer your master. Sin is a master, isn't it? Sin is a master. It's a, it's a slave driver is what it is. It says, well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? Of course not. Do you realize, or he says, don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? That's a, heavy, that's a heavy word, isn't it? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death. Or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Don't you realize that you become the slave to whatever you choose to obey? He said it's a choice. You choose to obey one or the other. It's just like whenever he's talking about, Jesus is talking about money. It's, it, the term is mammon. People are like, what is mammon? Mammon is money. He says, you can't serve both. You can't go wholeheartedly after one and the other. You're going to serve one and hate the other or hate the one and serve the other. But he says, you become a slave to whatever you obey. We have desires in our hearts to, to serve and obey God. We want to serve and obey God and uphold this, this word so that we can be righteous and right standing with Him, so that we can represent Him well. But we also have this desire to sin. The word says that there's fun in sin for a season, but it says for a season. 
Have you ever done something that was sinful and you thought it was really fun and it was really fun, but then all of a sudden, that's not fun anymore. In fact, you realize the pain that it brings, the suffering that it brings. What was so much fun is now so painful. Maybe it's just because it's painful to somebody else that you love. And, and you're drawing closer to God and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and letting you realize this might be fun to you, but it hurts like crazy to, to these people. It hurts like crazy to the people around you. And whenever you're doing it, you don't represent me well. Because that's not what I have for you. I have something so much better for you. Paul had to repeat things a lot in here. He repeated things over and over. And you might think, why did he have to repeat that so many times? Well, let me ask you something. Do you always get it on the first time? Me neither. I'm telling you. Like, I, Brittany, have you had to tell me more than once something? Don't answer that. And any of you with spouses or, or even kids in here or whatever, you know, think of, yeah. sorry, Tom. Think about it, though. We have to tell people over and over or we have to do things over and over, like before we get it. It says that it takes something like 30 days of doing something repetitively to create a habit, you know, 30 days, probably more for me, but it takes a long time of doing something over and over and over before you get it. That's why Paul is saying this over and over and over, because he knew that I would be reading this, and if he just said it once, I might miss it. That's why he has to repeat it over and over. <clears throat> and obviously, people of that time, they didn't pick up on it either. They just heard that grace thing. Have you ever heard something you catch on to one little piece of it? but the rest of it kind of went out the window? Well, I think that's what was happening here. I think that's why he has to repeat it over and over. Literally the same line was twice in the same chapter. Of course not. No, that's not the, that's not the thing. But I love how he goes on here, and in, in verse 17, um, he starts to talk about, Slavery and sin and stuff and being subject to this sin is slavery. He says, thank God. So he said, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Thank God, with an exclamation mark. He was exclaiming, thank God. He says, once you were slaves to sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we've given you. This teaching that we've given you. So do you remember whenever Paul was on the road to Damascus? His name was Saul at the time. And he has this encounter with Jesus. And Jesus asked him, why are you persecuting me? And he blinds him. We talked about this. But God, God starts to reveal things to him. He starts to open up the actual truth of the word to him. Paul knew the, 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 the Old Testament. He knew the Torah and the law. Um, he knew all of the, the prophets so well because he studied it over and over and over. Well, you can know something, but then whenever the light bulb's turned on and you understand, that's a whole different story. It's a whole different ballgame because you can start to apply your knowledge appropriately. Sorry, I, I cut the mic. That was loud. Was it loud to you guys too? Oh, God. It was the Lord. <laughs> Maybe. But he says, Thanks, thank God, once you were... Once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we have given you. God downloaded this teaching to Paul for him to be able to give it to us. He said first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles, the sinners, the godless, those who don't obey the law. He gives it to all of us. Now you are free from your slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteous living. We purposefully, we willingly, maybe not purposefully, but willingly put ourselves under the bondage and the slavery, the yoke of sin. We 
We willingly did it. We willingly went there. You know, it says that we're born into sin. Born into sin. So we were there, but now, now we have become slaves to righteous living. Because the weakness of our human nature, I am using the illustration of slavery to help you understand all of this. So we, we here in the United States, especially now, we're, we're many, 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 many years removed from slavery as a, an openly accepted practice in this nation. But just like Rod was talking about, that movie that just came out, it's shining a massive light on actual slavery today. We're talking millions upon millions of people in sex trafficking, sex slavery, human slavery. Like, people are buying and selling humans today. Right now, today, we're sitting in these nice, comfortable chairs, in this nice, safe, comfortable air conditioning and all this stuff with people that aren't trying to abuse us and kill us, that aren't trying to do all these horrible things to us. But there are millions of people that are being oppressed, that are under slavery right now, in bondage right now. We can look back on history and we can look at the different types of slavery in different areas of the world and understand a little bit of what slavery is like. But being a slave to something or to someone means you don't get to make your own decisions. You don't get to. It's not your choice. You don't have the right. You can't get up and leave. You can't just unchain yourself and walk out. You don't get to. It's called being a slave. And we were a slave to sin. And now we get to be a slave to righteous living. We get to be a slave to something and someone that's so much better. It's like having a, a bond servant. A bond servant is somebody that is a slave but chooses to stay because the master treats them so well. They know it wouldn't be better, and even if it would be better, I don't want that. I want to still serve under this master because I know he loves me, because I know he cares for me. He's always taken care of me, and he always will. He's always provided for me, and he always will. He says, previously, you let yourselves be slaves. And we talked about that. We literally let ourselves be slaves. We let ourselves be slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, but all this led even deeper into sin. Now you must give yourselves to be slaves to righteous living so that you will become holy. That's how we will become holy, to, to give up and to give in to God. That's how we become holy. He makes us holy. 1 Peter 1.16 says, Be holy because I am holy. Be holy just as I am holy. Um, Peter was, was literally quoting Leviticus. There's three different places in Leviticus where God is telling His people, Be holy just as I am holy. But then he was telling them, do these things to be holy. But now we know he was telling them, do these things to be holy, because he knew he could, they couldn't, and he knew they wouldn't. Now he's saying, be holy just as I am holy. And Peter's saying, or Paul is saying, all you have to do is give yourself to be slaves to God. To let him work in your life, let him work through your life. He says, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. Isn't that interesting? When we were slaves to sin and we didn't know God and we didn't have a relationship with Him, we weren't under obligation to do anything right. Because He wasn't, there wasn't that expectation. But then there was that expectation whenever we got into this relationship with Him. You know, I was thinking about whenever the, uh, the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant in battle. That King Saul takes the Ark of the Covenant into battle and loses it. 
whoops, loses it, and they take it. But they didn't just die. When they touched it, they didn't die. There was no expectation that they would die. They had no understanding of this relationship with God. God didn't expect them to follow the Mosaic law on how to transport this thing, on how to carry it, on where to put it, and all that stuff. Literally, the ark was the, the indwelling of where the Spirit of God rested. And so whenever they took this ark, they put it in their temple of Dagon, and God just starts messing with their temple. Literally destroys Dagon, knocks him over, knocks his hands and his, his uh, head off. I mean, that's just so cool. I love that he did that. But as I'm reading through that, it's like, God, why didn't you just destroy anybody that touched it? And he says, because they didn't have an expectation. The, the covenant wasn't with them. The expectation wasn't with them. Now, they had to suffer the consequences for their actions of, of removing God from Israel. And so then they got boils and they got, you know, rats and all this stuff and, and pretty nasty stuff if you, if you really start to think about it. And so much so that they're like, we can't keep this thing. <laughs> we can't keep it. So they send it back. And whenever Israel gets this ark back, this, this, this ark where God dwells, whenever they get it back, they have to treat it the way that they were supposed to because of the expectations. Okay? And when they didn't, it starts to fall, right? Because they were moving it on a cart instead of having the Levites actually carry it. And somebody reaches out and touches it to steady it, and he dies, boom, instantly, because of the expectation. There were laws that go along with it and consequences for those laws. I don't know, I could go on with that. That's so fun to look into, but anyway. But he says, previously, you let yourselves be slaves to impurity and lawlessness, which led even deeper into sin. Now you must give yourselves to be slaves to righteous living so that you will become holy. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. And what was the result? That little, that little sentence right there, and what was the result, was like he's talking directly to me. You tried to do all this on your own. You tried to be righteous on your own. You tried... Um, to, to do the right thing on your own. Or you tried living in sin on your own. And he says, what was the result? What was the outcome? How did that work out for you? Is what he would have spoke directly to me. How'd that work out for you? Not good. That's how it worked out for me. Um, but he says, you are, you are now ashamed of the things you used to do. He's absolutely correct. Things that end in eternal doom. He's speaking to all of us. You are now ashamed of the things you used to do. I am ashamed of the sinful ways that I used to live. Absolutely mortified by them. He says, now you must give yourself... Oh, sorry, I jumped back up. But now you are free from the power of sin and have become slaves to God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. Isn't that great? He reminds us of who we used to be pre-Jesus, pre-Christ, pre-salvation, pre-grace. And then he says, but here's who you are. But now you are free from the power of sin and have become slaves to God. And now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. If you have kids in here, think about I know I always bring it back to like being a parent and, and relating with kids, you know? And for those of you that don't have kids yet, try to remember this for whenever you do because our God, like the third, the second song that we sang was Good, Good Father. Some of us maybe didn't have the perfect earthly father, right? Maybe some of us had great earthly fathers. But God is called our Good, Good Father because He treats us, and He loves us like the perfect earthly father should. So if you can imagine somebody that that loves their child so much, that cares for their child so much, that forgives their child whenever they they act out, whenever they, they mess up, they fail, 
they fall down. They don't do things exactly right. They don't meet their expectations. That father still loves them and gently corrects them and gently brings them back and still gives them everything that they need for life to sustain them, to benefit them, to send them in the right direction, to give them what they truly need to be able to live, right? And that's exactly who he is. He says that, that by keeping our eyes fixed on God, keeping our eyes fixed on that firm foundation and know that he will truly care for us and love us, and that, that we have that faith and that trust and that hope in him, it says, now you do the things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. The result in eternal life. Last week, Rod was talking about people that, that felt like that they needed to do all these things to, to please God. That people would literally crucify themselves. Can you imagine if your child was harming themselves thinking it was going to make you happy? Hurting themselves because they believe that's what you wanted for them. That's what you wanted. That's what you wanted so that they could make you happy. Wouldn't that crush you? It crushes our Heavenly Father. He doesn't want us to put ourselves in pain to please Him. We already please Him. He doesn't want us walking on our knees all the way to Rome. Think about that. That would literally shred all the, all the meat off of your knees. To please God? That's not what he wants. He doesn't want you hurting. He literally sent Jesus to remove your pain, to take pain away. Don't put yourself back into pain. Don't do that. The last verse of chapter 6 is one of my favorites. I mean, it's an absolute bedrock. He says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Whew. This free gift through Christ Jesus, if we accept Him and we believe Him and we love Him, we don't have to worry about the wages of sin. I don't know about you guys, but it's easy for me, most of my life, I've focused on that first part. The wages of sin is death. Scared me so bad. Scared me, scared me. Like, sin. I, I, I just believed that if I, if I sinned once and I died right after that, I'd go to hell. I'd burn in hell. That's absolutely wrong. It's absolutely wrong. Because this free gift that God gives us, is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. He gives it to us because He wants to be in relationship with us. Because He wants us in heaven with Him forever. Jesus even said in John 17, I want them to be with me where I am in my glory. The glory that I had before the foundations of the earth were formed. That's amazing. He wants us there. So we're not on this little pendulum. We're not on this bubble that if we sin once, the bubble pops and boom, you're burning that's just not the case. It's just not. Satan wants you to think that, but it's not the case. Because we get this free gift of God, this eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. If you're tired of sin and death, and you want this free gift, you can do it right now. Right now. If it's something that you feel like, you know what? I do understand that God loves me. I do understand that he sent his son to die on the cross for me. And that he rose again. So that I can have this free gift. And I want to take that free gift. I want to take advantage of it. You can do that today. You can do that absolutely today, right now. If you haven't taken advantage of that and you want to, um, you can, and you want somebody to help you with it, you can come up here. Uh, Rod will be up here. I'll be up here. I'm sure others will be up here ready to pray with you. Um, if you're watching online, 
It's yours to take. It's yours right now to take. All you have to do is tell God that you believe in him, you love him, ask him to forgive you of your sins, and then choose to live for him. That's it. And then allow him to change you from the inside out. Don't continue to walk in the same old life. Allow him to change you and watch him change you. It's amazing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your free gift of eternal life that was purchased for us through your Son, Jesus. Thank you, God, for your Holy Spirit that comes and lives in us, dwells in us and helps us, that leads us and guides us into all truth, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we don't have to do it on our own. Thank you that it's not some some recipe that we have to come up with. Thank you that it's free, God. Lord, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you. Help us to not fall into the the lies of the enemy and the temptations of the world, Lord. Thank you, God, that you provide a way out of every temptation. You provide that way out, God. Help us to remember to cry out to you whenever we feel like there's no other way, Lord. Help us to stay fixed in your will, Lord. God, we love you so much. I just pray for your peace that surpasses all understanding over everybody and under the sound of my voice. God, I pray that you will uh, just go before us and prepare the way for us, God. Help us to obey you and be obedient in what it is that you call us to do, even if it sounds like it doesn't make sense, Lord. Help us to obey you and know that you have the right way for us, that you have the perfect plan. God, we dedicate this day to you, this week to you, and our lives to you, Lord. We lay our lives down and we take up yours. We love you so much. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.